In this class we'll look at Checkland's self-systems methodology, sometimes known as SSM. We'll see that we're dealing here with problems that are ill-defined, problems that are unstructured. And this approach contrasts with the hard approach, the hard approach in which all the problems were highly structured, highly sequential, there was a start and an end and different processes could be identified within the system and each part, part of the system could be investigated and analysed. In the soft systems approach it's very unstructured as we'll see. The soft systems approach was developed by Checkland in the 1970s. The model was devised because there are problems that are not easily analysed. There are problems that are unstructured or the word messy comes to mind. It, these are uh, issues that maybe have variable uh, inputs or there might be probability issues or there might be random events that occur. Uh, it's difficult to analyse the system because it's it's not structured, it's, it's not well laid out as the hard system is. So it's it's dealing with a very unstructured situation. It leans to the soft approach, the Checkland approach, it leans to the soft approach because the model is based on soft properties that exist within organizations. Uh, when we have people for example, people working with systems or people working with people, we have highly complex relationships. Uh, there is scope for misunderstanding and disagreement and scope for uh, issues related to motivation and people not pulling their part in on time and we have it's a messy situation and people are not like machines they've got their own way of doing things so uh, it leans towards a soft system Organizations are not always clearly defined. Organizations have got rough edges. They, they've got uh, ambiguity in parts of it. And it's almost impossible to remove the ambiguity. So we're dealing with what's known as soft systems. Checkland used the, the term soft systems method methodology to apply to real world problems. Now real world problems means problems that we can encounter on a daily basis and that have no obvious means of solution or of analysis. There is simply too much happening simultaneously there are perhaps too many variables in the system, the relationship between the variables is not completely understood, the variables affect each other, uh, there are random components, uh, there are people involved. So the outcomes are not predictable, not rigidly predictable at least. So it applies to that sort of real world situation. The underlying assumption of the model assumes that there is no such thing as reality. All individuals perceive reality in different ways. So the, the underlying assumption is that uh, the soft systems approach applies to situations where there is no obvious way of predicting the outcome. It's, it's messy. And people can have different opinions about what the outcome will be and, and how to do the particular tasks and, and how to structure the particular tasks. There will be a variety of opinions and a variety of attitudes and the outcomes themselves may be a surprise when, when they happen. So it's, it's very messy. People have different perspectives due to experiences, culture, values, education and people's realities change as they change throughout life. 
Uh, the way we see situations changes. It changes with our experiences. Um, at an early age, we might have a very clear picture of the relationships, let's say, in, in, in a company, the relationships in, in a particular part of the company. We have a very clear picture of how it works. But as we gain more experience and we see the system fail and we, we fix the system and it runs again, after a while we see the system that was once very clear, we see it much more uh, realistically and uh, it becomes much more complex. So our idea of what was real at the start was perhaps too simple. We become more complex as time has gone on. It's a seven stage process, the, the Checkland route. Um, there are seven stages to identifying and resolving unstructured problems and please note the term we're dealing here with unstructured problems. First of all we need to know what the problem situation is. Um, what is the problem? We need to identify the problem. We can't, we can't analyze or think about a problem unless we know what it is. So the first and most basic consideration is the problem situation. Second, we need to express the, the problem situation. We need to, uh, if you like, conceptualize it. We need to, to think about it. We need to, be able to write it down. We need to understand what the problem is. We've identified the problem in one. Now we need to express it. We need to work out precisely what is what are the issues involved. And we need to look at the root definitions of relevant systems. We need to be able to go back and understand any parts of the system, even though it's, it's fuzzy, it's messy. We need to go back and try and figure out what we, we do know about the system. Look at individual parts of the system and try to figure out the individual parts, because at least we've got something. We've, we've got some insight into the overall system if we can understand some of the subsystems, some of the, the component parts of the system. So we go back and look at the root definitions, what, what is required from all of the subsystems. And what sort of conceptual models can we, can we bring to bear? What do we know of the overall system? Well, that's messy, that's ill-defined. Well, the overall system uses the subsystems, as I said, so what do we know, know of the, the subsystems? How do they work? So we have some sort of picture of the individual components. We're trying to get what we can to try to make a decision. We're trying to pick out any piece of relevant information that will help us. So we are trying to capture any insight into the system that will help us understand the system. But we still recognize that it is messy, it still is unstructured, it still is very confusing, but we are trying to make the best of trying to pick out individual components and understand those. Conceptually, how do they work? We could look at um, the real world and models. We, we try to uh, look at the system and think what are the inputs, what are the outputs, uh, what sort of conceptual model would enable the, the inputs to be converted into the outputs. Now that's a conceptual thing, but in the real world what issues are there? What's, what's stopping the introduction of a very straightforward, linear, structured solution? What's, what's the problem? What, why can't we have a hard system? Why can't we have a logical system? Now it may be it's because of the nature of the product being produced. It may be that there are a variety of people involved with experiences, but the people don't see the issues in the same way. 
it could be that because of the, the structure of the company there is no obvious uh, solution to, to problems. The, the structure of the company stops the, the, the managers from devising systems which will be sequential and will feed one to the next. And that might be because of the history of the company, because uh, departmental managers are very strong and they don't want to be uh, a part of an overall system. They, they like to have their autonomy, they like to have their freedom, they like to be seen to be uh, in charge of their little empire within the company. Possible. It's necessary to define changes that are desirable and, fe and feasible. Look at the system, even though it's very complicated and very messy, look at the system and, and try to work out what is desirable, what, what would be a good solution. It may not be that it, it may be that it can't be applied to the overall system, maybe to just a part of it. What would be a good solution for this particular part? What's desirable? And is it possible? What are the blockages that stop it from being implemented? At least define the blockages. Define the impediments to the development of a very rational system. And finally, take action to improve the real world situation. Uh, having got a picture of the overall system, albeit very messy, having got a picture of the subsystems and how they work and how having conceptualized the subsystems and understood them and how they fit together, uh, try to work out what is desirable for the whole system. Uh, try to work out why the, that solution can't be implemented, what are the impediments, and then try and take action to improve the real world situation, improve the situation that exists at the moment. Now, this seven stage process, well we can look at it uh, a bit like the real world, we have a domain for the real world, the top part of this slide, and then we have a conceptual component of the solution, the bottom part of the slide. Now we'd start with recognize a real world problem situation. So we, we just recognize it. What What is the, the real world problem situation? What is the system? How complex is the system? Why is it messy? Who are involved? How is it done? And try and get some understanding of the complexity of the system. So we, we try to express the problem situation. Try to capture the essentials of the system and write them down. Try to get them understood so that there's a very complicated system, it's very messy, it's very amorphous, difficult to say exactly where it starts or ends and uh, it's, it's complex. So express the, the problem situation. Try and get a handle on it. Try to write it down. Try and understand it. Try to break it down into component parts. So try to define the problem in terms of its assumptions. So we, we've expressed the problem. We, we've, we've understood the problem. Now break it down in terms of its assumptions. How, how does the, the system work at the moment? And what are the parts of the system and how do they fit together? Try to define the system in terms of its parts and in terms of how the parts link to each other. Try to understand what's happening in terms of relevant models. Just look round at uh, different systems and see how other systems work. Look at the very messy system, the one you're studying, and then try to see if there's some aspect of 
transferability of, of, of the model from one situation to the other, from, from the, the one which is clearly understood, perhaps a hard system that's clearly understood, to this very messy one. Are there parts that could be inserted or changed that would make it more structured and more easily maintained, more efficient? So what are the relevant conceptual models? How could the existing system be compared with relevant conceptual models? Models of good practice, uh, say within the industry. And compare the models with the real world. Look at the, the real world. Look at the situation that you're studying. This very messy situation. This very ill-defined situation. And compare that with the, the models, the, the abstract models, the models which suggest how it should be done. And look at shortfalls, look at complexities, and look at the, the situation. Why, why is it the real world one, the one you're studying, does not match the conceptual ones? What are the issues? Try to identify the impediments from moving from the very messy one, the real world one, to the conceptual one. What are the, 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 the obstacles? Why can't it be changed? So it's the comparison between the, the real world and the conceptual that gives this uh, systematic assessment of the changes that are required. So now we have we've got our very messy system, we've got conceptual models, we're looking at the variance, the differences between the two of them, and this difference tells us the the changes that are required. It may not be possible to implement these for all sorts of reasons we're dealing with people, we're dealing with, we're dealing with managers within departments who, as I said, may be empire building. They, they may be trying to protect their department and protect their power. Uh, workers may not want to change the system because they've got more freedom, because it is very loosely defined and uh, they just need to keep it running. They don't want to have a system that uh, times them and, and make sure that they are performing particular routines at particular times. They're going to lose their freedom perhaps. So this has just been thrown up as um, the differences between the real world and the conceptual. And then try to take action to resolve the problem. Having assessed the differences. Are there any changes that can be implemented to to bring about uh, changes to this very messy system that will make it more logical and more streamlined and more efficient? As I said, that's the seven stage process. And these are the various stages that we've we've looked at. Now let's look at, first of all, the problem situation. Well, identify and invest investigate the unstructured problem or messy situation that needs to be resolved. So investigate it, identify it, look at it, know where, it, where the, the unstructured problem is, and then investigate it. And try to work out why is it unstructured? Why, what's, why is it developed like this? Situations or problems are normally identified by people that are in authority or affected by the problem. So when 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 workers further along the along along the the system, if you like, have to deal with a messy part of a system, they may object to lack of continuity or lack of quality or uh, there may be issues and this will help to identify where the problem is and why is it messy? Why is it a problem? 
The consultants, usually within the organisation, carries out investigations regarding the problem. So it may require a team of specialists to look at the overall system. Uh, it could be a computer system, or it could be um, an office routine, or it could be a shop floor engineering problem, or whatever. The consultants will look at the overall system, they'll look at the various components of the overall system, they will identify the component which is unstructured, that part of the system that's unstructured, and see why is it unstructured, why, why did it develop this way. So they will carry out an investigation that identifies the problem. Once the problem has been identified, research is collected through interviews, interviewing the people involved in that unstructured part of the system, uh, using primary and secondary data, interviewing people directly, talking to people directly, and also making observations, and trying to pick up any quantitative information, and also qualitative, by making observations and trying to get people's opinions about what needs to be done and so on. So the precise area of problem is defined. And that's the problem situation. So it's working out where this messy problem is. And once that's done, then we move on to the problem situation and how it can be expressed. So it's, it's important to identify the soft elements of the problem. Now, soft elements are means elements that are not structured and that can't really be structured. Uh, it could be simply because people are working with people and uh, people are not machines. So there are mistakes that people can make and errors can creep into work and um, timings may be off because people are away ill or on holiday or people are having a bad day. So elements can creep in. Um, it's a soft system. It could be that producing a rich, a rich picture to express the problem will help. Rich pictures involve drawings and pictures using images and uh, symbols to represent all elements of the problem. A rich picture, in other words, is again a very messy picture. It's a picture with everything that's known about the situation put onto a piece of paper and it'll help to identify uh, linkages between all of the various components of this very messy problem that has arisen. So a rich picture is just uh, everything that's known about the situation and all the connections that are known between the various parts of the system um, anything that's known about the system, who's involved, and, and any areas of ignorance, any areas that are that are not known, but are seem to be relevant, but it's difficult to work out why they're relevant. So um, a rich picture could be something like that. Uh, this one comes from Ronald and B, 2005. Well, as you can see, it's there are people with question marks and lines crossing and it's, it's just a bit of a mess but having said that it captures this unstructured problem and it's a question of trying to uh, fix and understand each of these lines and each of the symbols and filling out information where there's a question mark, resolving it and and moving forward with it. And there are different types of rich picture that the, the literature throws up. And it's worthwhile going online and just investigating types of rich, rich picture that are uh, possible. So rich pictures include all the stakeholders, the workers, the managers, the suppliers, the customers, the management, and so on. So rich pictures can include all of the stakeholders. It looks at the structure, particularly the structure of that particular problem. It looks at the processes. 
it looks at uh, the climate within which the, the problem arises. Um, it looks, if you like, instead of climate, you could look at the environment, the internal environment in which the problem arises. It looks at people and their views and their conflicts. So it's, uh, it is a very complex uh, picture. It, it tries to capture as much about the problem as is possible. Right, so the rich picture is useful uh, as it illustrates human activities and from this conclusions can be drawn, at least sometimes can be drawn. But at least everything relevant to the problem has been captured on a piece of paper. Then it's a question of trying to clarify what's not known, clarify the relationships, clarify uh, issues that are causing confusion and um, issues that are causing the, the fuzziness or the, the messiness in the first place. Formulate root definitions of the relevant systems. This stage involves taking uh, a look at the rich picture and considering a world view, looking at a, a much bigger picture. Root definitions involve devising solutions based on different points of view of people involved in the problem. The environment of the situation, the culture, the norms, the values, the relationships. So look at the the problem. It's not well defined. There are all sorts of complexities and it's a real world situation. Now talk to the individuals involved. Try to get their views. Try to get an understanding of the issues that concern them and what they think. So it's it's moving it up towards uh, looking at the views of the people directly involved to see what they would do to resolve the issue. They may not want to do anything. They might revel in the fact that it is messy and unstructured because it gives them more freedom, as I said earlier. Or they may enjoy more structure and feel more secure because there is greater clarity in the workplace. So it's important to talk to them and get their views. The core purpose of the system is established and representation of the system, people involved, people affected by the problem, people that are taking part in the problem. Once the core purpose of that system is understood, then that's a big breakthrough because the core purpose of the system is the rationale for the system. That tells us why that particular messy system is in place. Now what can be done to clarify it? What can be done to make it more structured, make it more efficient. Chickland introduced cattle analysis to identify different perspectives. First of all, customers. Anyone who is directly involved and may benefit or suffer from the system. For example, the workers may experience redundancies because the system is so messy and so confusing that it's not efficient and it may lead to redundancies. But who is affected by the system? So that's one of the key considerations. It may be the customers for the final product who don't experience good quality work because there is a lack of control within the system. Uh, the customers may experience uh, irregular supplies of the product because the system is not well defined. Or the workers, as I said, could face redundancies. The actors, the individuals who have implemented the system and will undertake activities to make the system work. So who are the people who are looking at the system and who are trying to devise solutions to it. Are they appropriate? Have they got the skills that are necessary? Um, 
do they understand the system and have they got a methodology for the analysis of the system which will enable them to make the changes that are required. The transformation process Um, now, transformation, uh, transforming the, uh, the, the system brings all sorts of issues, and I, I leave this sentence just dangling because it brings, well, what does it bring? It brings lots of issues. The issues could be <laughs> associated with motivation in the workplace. The workers who are working with a very ill-defined system, some of them may enjoy it and revel in the fact that they are doing something that others can't do uh, or find difficult to cope with the uncertainties of the system and the inefficiencies of the system. The transformation system may bring uh, a lot of satisfaction to those workers but it may also may bring a lot of dissatisfaction to others who enjoy a more structured approach. It may bring dissatisfaction to customers as I just said because of continuity of supply and the quality of the work. But transforming the system into something which is uh, more structured, a harder system, may bring about uh, issues in training, issues in motivation, issues in changing working practices. And if the messy system had been in place for quite a long time, then workers may be reluctant to to make changes. What gives transformation meaning? Well, the world view is uh, the wider view, the wider view of the company, of the market, of the customers. The world view is, is what is required. What's required is continuity of supply, good quality product at the right price, uh, good logistics, good aftercare service. This is what's required from any system. Now transforming the, uh, the real world situation, the, the messy system, into one which satisfies the requirements of current markets is the ultimate purpose of the change. That's why the change has been proposed. Moving from a messy system to one which is structured and which will have uh, greater uh, bring greater satisfaction to the final customer. Having spent their, their cash to get the product, they've got a good product with good after sales service and the product is as described. It is not haphazard. It is not put together um, simply because there is a messy system within the company. So the transformation process is critically important. It's moving from something which is very amorphous, very ill-defined, to something which is more structured and um, better capable of uh, analysis and measurement to see if it's meeting targets. But having said all of this, it's still worth noting that sometimes messy systems can't be changed because of the nature of the product, the nature of the service, and the fact that it relies on soft systems. It relies on people. It relies on the fact that uh, certain circumstances related to the production of the product or the service change and are changing almost on a random basis. Now in, in those situations soft systems will persist. There, There is simply no alternative. Um, the world is not really um, designed to meet the scientific method. The world does not run in straight lines. We know from our day-to-day -day existence that we are constantly surprised by situations that occur. Um, 
roads are closed off for maintenance or the bus doesn't run on time or the train does not run on time or uh, something happens, the weather interferes with something uh, with, with the transportation system. We know this happens and therefore we need to be flexible and have an acceptance of soft systems to cope with this. What we're doing so far in this session is trying to look at areas that can be altered and thereby bring about greater efficiency. It's under the Cato um, assumptions or analysis the owner should also be uh, brought into consideration. Um, it's the owner who can make or break the system. It's the owner who can uh, tolerate the soft system or try to move towards a harder system or try to understand why there is a soft system in play. It's the owner who ultimately has the decision to make as to whether to um, stay with the soft system or try to uh, move towards something which is more structured and more methodical. But as I said earlier, it, it may be that there simply has to be an understanding of the need for the soft, soft system and people need to reconcile to that. Finally, um, there has to be some understanding and appreciation of the, the wider environmental constraints in which all of this will take place and probably these are best summed up in the PESTO type of analysis, the politics, economic, the social issues, the technological, the legal and the um, environmental. So any changes to a system should really consider whether all of these are relevant or some of them are relevant and in what way they are relevant. So it's important to have an understanding of these. Conceptual models. Well, root definitions or that phase uh, is converted into a conceptual model. This stage considers how the system will function in order to achieve its objectives. So if we understand the system, this soft system, as a set of inputs, then something happens, the soft system, and a set of outputs, then is there a conceptual model that can convert the inputs into the outputs? Is there a conceptual model that is very efficient and logical and straightforward that can replace this very messy system, this soft system? Again, diagrams are often used in the form of flow charts to illustrate the process of the system and setting instructions. So looking at rational models, looking at very precise models, at least it may indicate something of the soft system. Uh, but as I said a few slides back, it's still worth bearing in mind that nature can surprise us. Uh, the weather can affect transportation systems and when it does then soft systems may be more appropriate. Having people who can, uh, with experience, who can deal with customers and get them through their destinations uh, through alternative routes or alternative ways, having that sort of um, unstructured and yet relevant information may be um, very important. It's necessary to monitor and control the performance of systems and this can be done by uh, looking at the effectiveness of the system. Uh, looking at is the system working correctly? Is it the right thing to do? Is, um, is the system functioning correctly? So looking at the effectiveness of the system. 
So it's monitoring the system and controlling the system and looking at is the system functioning correctly? Is, is it, is it, are the processes being dealt with effectively? And the efficacy of the system, does it work? Uh, there may be a system that it does not work. It's, it's a failed system. And sometimes failed systems have a persistence. They can continue to exist even though clearly they do not function effectively. So would it not be better to overthrow that soft system and try and institute something better, something more structured or something which will work more effectively. And the efficiency of the system. Uh, does the system minimize costs? Is it, does it make good use of resources? So it's looking at the effectiveness, the efficacy and the efficiency of the system. And these three are important in the monitoring and controlling the system. Monitoring it to see if it meets these three and controlling it to ensure that when it comes it comes off the rails, when it when it does not meet these three, that it can be fixed and rectified and put back into position. Comparisons with uh, real world and models. Well, this is where we compare the real world and the models. The conceptual models are compared with the rich picture. So, developing a rich picture, like we talked about much earlier, that gives us some sort of understanding of all of the issues involved in this very messy system and bits that we don't understand and linkages between different parts of the system. So now it's it's important to discuss and debate the current situation and of and defining room for improvement. Look look at the existing system and see what improvements can be made. There may be piecemeal. Perhaps the whole system can't be changed, but perhaps individual parts of the system can be clarified and improved. So instead of rejecting the whole soft system, the the very messy part of, of the system. Instead of rejecting it, just make some improvements to the individual parts of it. Maybe that's the way forward. Comparisons and discussions involve comparing scenarios, comparisons of key players, contrasting views and ideas in order to arrive at feasible decisions. So we've got a very messy system, the solve system, we can't overthrow it because we can't see any other way of doing it. We can look at individual parts of that system to see if they can be improved. And one of the ways to do that is to talk to people involved, people working in the system. What do they think would be a better way of doing certain tasks? What, what's their opinion of the, the system? Um, how can it be improved? So it's involving perhaps people involved with the system. Defining changes that are desirable and feasible. Well, this stage brings together all the stages and analysis is formed and changes that, the, that are desirable and feasible are considered. So this stage is, it brings everything together. It brings all of the considerations of whether soft or hard, if they're going to continue with the soft system, looking at the individual components of the soft system, talking to the the various actors, the, the people who can bring about change, talking to people who have knowledge, the people who work with the system, bringing all of that together. All the viewpoints of participants and people directly linked to this problem situation are considered. So try and take all the views because the answer may be in some of those views. Final decisions are agreed by all members involved in the problem. There must be some sort of consensus when a change is proposed. Otherwise, there will be reluctance on the part of some, perhaps key players, 
to implement a new system. So try and get consensus, try and get agreement that the system was inefficient or it wasn't appropriate or whatever. Try to get an agreement on that and then try and make the changes based on the agreement. Now, uh, finally, the decisions are transferred to the final stage for implementation. So the, this part is implementation. This stage involves the execution of planned actions and strategies. So after all of the analysis, all of the discussions, all of the observations and all of the data collection, it's necessary to implement some recommendation that has been agreed, that there is consensus about. So execute the planned actions. The Agreed actions are in place and all members involved are allocated tasks and responsibilities for overseeing operations. So having worked out what's needed to be done, assign the various actions to individuals and get them to implement it, get them to make the changes. It could be that this is phased in over a period of time. So the old uh, messy system, the soft system, is continued whilst the new system is phased in and uh, <clears throat> it's observed as to whether it's going to make a big improvement or not so it's, it, it could be phased in over some time. Continuous reviews are, um, take place to ensure the system is progressing as planned. The soft systems methodology is a cyclical model. If problems are not resolved the process will begin again so that's the way the, the soft system methodology works. It, it works in, in a way that if the system fails then it goes back to the start and starts again. Um, the, the processes are not rigorously defined and the sequence of the, pro uh, of the, the various processes may not be rigorously defined. Um, so if there is a failure, then it goes back and relies on the experience of the personnel who work within the system to make ad hoc changes to the system that will enable it to function. But there may be, and this is what I'm suggesting right throughout, there may be uh, some sort of drive to look at individual components of that system and try to make those harder, make those more linear, more more logical in some respects, if possible. But again, it may not be possible because of all sorts of issues uh, involved. Um, now, strengths of the the model. So far, we've been criticising it. Uh, quite considerably, but there are strengths to the model. Um, it provides a structure to complex and ambiguous problems, especially within organizations and political environments. Whatever we're dealing with people, we tend to be dealing with soft situations and uh, when problems are very complicated and very ambiguous, the soft systems approach may be the most appropriate. Um, people solve the problem for themselves. People link to each other in very flexible ways to try and solve the problem. The model takes account of differing views and perspectives of all individuals involved in the problem. Uh, it does take into account different views, but it needs to reconcile different views as well to have a coherence to get an outcome. If the different views are not reconciled, there may be no outcome. So that's a strength of the, the system. It, it takes in all the different points of view. But it could also be a criticism of the system. If the different views are not reconciled, then the system could break down. The problem, or the model I should say, is tailored 
to meet the needs of different problem situations. It is flexible. There's a problem, individuals come together, they find solutions, uh, they work out the solutions for themselves, uh, they are flexible, they deal with the issues as they arise and they cope with the uncertainty and the ambiguities of the situation. So it's, it's a big strength of the model. The limitations of the SSM model, of the soft systems methodology, well, in order for the model to be successful, all the participants must be willing to adapt to the changes and approach. So, if soft systems methodology is going to be used, then there must be goodwill on the part of those involved in the system to make it work. They must try to make it work. There's no guidelines for the system and there's no guidelines how to build the system, how to maintain the system. It is done by the participants on the spur of the moment. They, they work out solutions as the problems arise. They deal with each other and they try to get solutions that work. They may not work the next time round. A new set of solutions might be required, but but to continue to to move the system by solving individual problems as they arise. There's a high degree of uncertainty as the model deals with problems that are unstructured. And the problems can change at any time during the process. So the workers uh, live with the risk of breakdown at any moment. They live with uh, they live on an edge. The, the system is working, but it could fail at any moment because something new happens, something they haven't encountered before happens, and they have to have they have to be flexible enough to deal with whatever that issue is. And it's very time consuming and costly because they spend time trying to solve problems. Uh, when the problem arises, they've got to think about it, they've got to try out different solutions. There is no manual for them to consult and uh, no methodology for them to solve the problem very efficiently and straightforwardly. They have to work it out themselves and they have to work it out afresh every time a problem arises. So it's, it is time consuming and it is costly. There's a one of the sources that I mentioned uh, earlier on in the uh, presentation and that's all I'm going to do on this very important topic of soft systems methodology. To leave it at that and say thank you for watching. <laughs>